Dine, how you very, been? Boy? Have you have you been, Dolly? I have been very well, thank you. I mean, we've had. Let's face it, we've had. You know, the heat has started. Summer. So started. I'm one of those. It really slows me down. Oh, really? I won't lie. You know, I become like a slug. But <laughs> other than that, yeah, other than that, no, I'm doing fine, just fine. You know, I just had my um, I just had my checkup for How'd my go? cancer. And so um, to find out. Went really well, yeah. You know, yeah. In fact, I I had you know the mammogram um, checking on everything, and I was really surprised and really thrilled because the radiologist, a young woman, after she I stayed there, and after she read my mammogram, she came into the room and said, everything's great, everything's great. And she came over and she said, I just wanted to let you know that everything is just fine. And I was and just enthusiastic and wanted to tell me the good news herself. And I just thought that was the coolest thing. That is great. I really, yeah, I really, really thought that was great of her to do that. So right. that was cool. So huh? I'm stoked. You know, six <laughs> months later, uh, that, that's what I was about to ask. How long has this journey been for you? Well, it's been, well, since I was first diagnosed, that was last July. And um, my surgery was about September 1st. So it's actually been longer than six months. Mm -hmm. But um, so, yeah, so everything's good so far. And then I meet with the breast surgeon again um, in about a week and a half. And then I meet with the oncologist. There's also ongoing meetings with the oncologist who checks my blood work every three months. So do you feel, do you feel good? I mean, you do a lot of stuff. How do you feel now? Like compared to it's all over, do you feel pretty good or do you feel like, Oh no, oh, I, I, is everything pro, feel pretty good? Great. No, no, I feel great. I'm back to normal in how I feel. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. I feel great. Mm -hmm. Cause you know, I heard somebody say the other day, um, because, you know, we've talked about my cancer situation, and I heard somebody say the other day that um, that we, sorry about this, I'm, I'll turn my health ringer off there, uh, that, you know, somewhere like in 100 years, 200 years, 1,000 years from now, they're going to look back on the way we treat cancer, the way we look back on the way people did medicine in the Middle Ages with bleeding and leeches. <laughs> they're going to be like, I can't believe they put radiation in people's body, you know, yeah. barbaric yeah. things and yeah. all that kind well, of stuff. What I was reading, though, recently in the art magazine with an interview with an oncologist, a very famous one, I can't remember his name, but he was saying that because the, the article was about when are we going to cure cancer? And he said, we're not. Cancer is going to be around for the next thousand years. He said, it's impossible that we're going to cure cancer. But I think you're right. I think the way we approach treating cancer well you know that advances every day and unfortunately at the moment it also gets dramatically more expensive every time there is a new treatment it used to be that chemo what would cost you maybe five thousand a month and hopefully your insurance would cover it now the new chemo drugs are fourteen thousand a month in just a matter of a few, yeah they jump exponentially a few thousand a year they jump you know exponentially each year right. so but that's the drug companies we know that exactly so, yeah, but, yeah. Ah. so hopefully what's going to happen maybe is that it gets more like a lesser disease and you know the um the rates of living longer will improve what's interesting is that there are a number of cancers where the improvement in survival rates has not happened at all like which, like which ones like which ones what are um, the... i'm trying to remember but like pancreatic yeah. cancer like yeah is that what happened is it alex so what happened alex trevec kind of was it the one he had the jeopardy host yeah. yeah you might live longer than you used to when you were diagnosed but um you know it, it, it's just oh and patrick swayze that's when he died of uh but uh, you know esophageal cancer no right. because it basically cuts off your ability to you know take in food there are there are some where they've made almost no progress at all and there was another one um i think it was um 
not uterine cancer, but uh, a fallopian tube cancer, you know, or. Um, well, like uh, my situation, prostate cancer, you know, I think they've done some good advances there. You know, they have that new form of surgery. They have. Yes, and, I know. And, my cousin's your situation. He yeah, has right. had it for years. He's had it for probably almost 20 years. Oh. And they just keep watching it. See, and then when some. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what they do now. They've kind of learned with prostate cancer that we don't have to panic. There's a certain type of diagnosis. They're not all the same, right? They're some more aggressive than others. And I think there's certain less cancer too, is that we don't have to all of a sudden jump on treatment. There's different levels it, of cancer. So like me, yeah. it's like, you know, who you're talking about there. We have this sort of low, so we just watch it. It's called, it's called active surveillance, which is a very yeah. legitimate protocol to watch it. Like, you know, they watch my PSA. And what's so funny is like, my PSA kind of went up close to this dangerous area and that we didn't do anything. We took it again and now it's dropped back down. And they're like, well, it's a good thing we didn't do anything. We didn't necessarily have to, you know, but that was a right. little risky, you know, because it did get up to that little area where they would say, we need to start talking about treatment. And it just, I had this eye thing going on and I didn't. And then they took it again and said, well, you've right. gone back down. So huh, there we go. So uh, there you are. And you're there just you keeping go. it. And I know that um, we have another friend who's been diagnosed with it now. They kept an eye on it for a while, but the plan was that he would have radiation. So now he's undergoing radiation. And I keep prodding my husband, you know, call him. He's a good friend. Call him. And Mark's kind of like, eh. But I think maybe that's kind of a guy response because the thought of another guy go undergoing treatment for such a, you know, tender area of the body. Hey, dude, how's your prostate going, man? What's yeah. What about that Bears game? Come on, no, man. That no, call no. and your prostate, by the way, your prostate. I know, but the thing that I That dude conversation, you know. <laughs> the thing I learned about you guys in these situations is you start using language that put me into just, you know, laughing spasms, I had to admit, because... We women, you know, it's all technical terms. Oh, you know, breast and this and that. It's all very technical. But he, when he was on the phone with his friend, man, it was not at all. It was like, like what's so well. How are you doing down there? I, oh. You know, <laughs> when he got off the phone, describing to me what he was going to have to have done just to have to prep him for the radiation. I was like, <laughs> Your husband, I just, like I don't want to, don't want to talk about you it. Guys, yeah, discuss this in a whole different way, you know. <laughs> so anyway, it was like, but he has he has now started his radiation, but it was several months after he was diagnosed. And um, having gone through radiation myself, I've said, I would, you know, I'd really like you to check in on him because Mark went through all of that with me and was there. And I thought, you know, you really know how to talk to him. So check in on him. So one thing, anyway, to talk to your, one thing to talk to your wife about it, another thing to talk to your buddy about his prostate, you know, it just, it just, it wasn't, we weren't really raised that way, right? <laughs> so yeah, I totally, but I think it's great that you're doing well, yes, and so. time is on your side, because right, I think so, with cancer, because every day they come out with new treatments, and you think things you know, it's so funny. Better. Ty and I were talking about this the other day, you know, because it's NF, it's NF Awareness Month again. Right. right? I know we've talked about that before, you know, but his father died of it back in the 70s. 76, he was 39. 39. But he went through some pretty horrible treatments, didn't he? Yeah, right? yeah. Radiation like, and stuff, oh. his hair fell out and nausea. Oh, and oh yeah. That was terrible. It's mid-70s, though. So I don't know but you say, you say it's come a long way since then, huh? Oh, definitely. Definitely. And Todd, look at you. I mean, you're going strong. And it's what? How many years later? Think about it. Yeah. Just yeah. I'm 60. I lost a brother at 20, but it's also I, I work out and I try to eat well. I do drink. Right. <laughs> yeah, we do that. Right. Right. Yeah. But you know, but but it's all about you know nutrition and and, and lifestyle. You, you can't sit around like a slug and be healthy. Well, I still think there's two something like like the way we eat affects cancer. You know, we've talked about this before. And Todd's kind of been living proof of that. That you know he has neurofibromatosis, which is tumors which could any of them come of cancers, but he feels like, and there's, he's sort of a living example that eating clean, eating organic Helps foods, kind of maintain. Yeah. Cause if we eat all these processed food with all these growth hormones and I mean, putting growth hormones in your body, well, tumors are going to grow off of those too, you know? So. Uh, oh my goodness. I know. 
I know. And I have to admit, I can do better with that, but I certainly eat a lot better than a lot of people I know, for right. sure. I try to eat really well. And of course, like you, I try to make exercise and I do make exercise a big part of my day and my life and always have. When I think back on it, it's funny because I'll talk to doctors and they all want to know, are you know, do, what do you do for exercise? Are you exercising? And I and I'll tell them, well, when I think about it, I've been exercising for about regularly for about 47 years. And um, when I say regularly, it's been about over 300 days a year for 47 years. Right. You know, when you think about it, so, and my husband goes, it's been more, more days a year than that. And I said, well, I just want to be, I want to be conservative because it has really. But I thought, that's not bad. <laughs> oh, that's not bad at all. It's really good. Yeah. Yeah, you know. Did you uh, do you like? Did you say you like to do yoga? I did yoga for many years. Right. Did yoga for many years, and um, it started to really uh, give me a lot of shoulder pain. Or let's just say I had a lot of shoulder pain while I was doing it. So eventually, I was doing it seven days a week for years. In addition to the outdoor um in addition to strength classes and also going outdoors and doing my hiking and walking so yes but then i started having this um shoulder, shoulder pain. pain and it just turned out that the yoga itself in a lot of ways just wasn't working for me so i just settled with the number of hours i was doing my weight training and my um aerobic yeah, there you go. That's all you have to do. Todd takes yoga like once a week. On oh, Wednesday. Once a week. Yeah. You know, back, back in classes. I guess people are back in classes now. You know, everything. Do you think everything's back to normal now? Are you taking classes or going to the gym like back like always? Oh, oh I take two classes a week, but they're still with my girlfriend who is an instructor in her garage. It's so funny because we started it because of the pandemic shutdown and we had to do it out in the open because of um, Kemp's uh, mandate that you could only do things with friends if you were out in the open. Remember, it was a really strict mandate there for a while with the shutdown. Yeah. So what we did was we started working out on a tennis court, two of us with our girlfriend, and then this tennis court in their community, in the homeowners association, they said, no, you can't do that. So they what? shut us what is, yes, what? I know we were doing a lot of harm, right? So right. anyway, <laughs> HOA, that, don't get me started. Yeah. All that, you know, boom box, I'll say that it was on her phone. All that music was really bothering people, I guess. So we went to her driveway and then winter came along. So we thought, oh, we better move into the garage. So now it's been over two years. Y'all still there. We are still doing it because we have so much fun and we've added one friend. So now there are four of us and it has worked out through the entire pandemic and we're still having such a good time. And so we're still doing it. it sounds, so I'm working. Is, two days is, it week. Of, is it kind of exclusive though? A little bit. You have to know somebody. Oh, to get we, this club yeah, or? yeah. You know, we have the secret password. You know, <laughs> oh, really? I, it, it's exclusive. Is it a good and, we're all having a great time. We so. were talking about this just the other day because this is April. Well, now it's May, but it was April. And it was April 2020 that was the month that was it. I mean, if you remember April 2020, that's when everything, that was the height of the lockdown. And I was yeah. trying to like rewind my, I mean, it seems like forever ago, but then it seems like yesterday in a way. You know, it's kind of weird because I was thinking two years ago, all of our favorite restaurants were closed down. Everybody was doing takeout. Uh -huh. You know, you were passing people in the street like this with, you know, mask yeah. all over you, like, uh, you know, uh, yeah. oh, and, uh, everybody just freaking out over freaking, the mask. You know, and, oh. and, and you would go to like, you know, we live here in the heart of Buckhead in Atlanta and, you know, traffic, you go there on a Friday night and there'd be nothing. You couldn't see, I mean, it'd be nobody, no cars or be a lone car pass by and they're like, 
Man, it's yeah. just it's two the years ago. The the freeway, nothing. Nothing, exactly. It's hard to believe it's been two years. It kind of feels like it's been forever. So here's the big prophetic question. Are we, I, I know everybody's got fatigue beyond years, but now we you always hear these other variants come up. Are we just like numb to it? We're like, ah, oh, variants marry it. You know, I don't know. Uh, you know, are we like, everybody's kind of over it. You know, we don't even uh, wear a mask anymore. To the we're over and we're vaccinated and boosted, you know, right. and everything. So we don't, yep. uh, but I don't, is everybody's just over it? I think we're all over it. Do I really do. I think we're just, it's, we're just in total burnout from it. Exactly. And I think most people now believe that it's going to be like the flu. Yeah. And I mean that it's probably going to come around every year. We'll see if it comes into a stronger form and comes back. I do believe that it is going to be a virus that's always going to be stronger than the flu. Yeah, I, I but, yeah. But if they can do, if they can come up with a yearly vaccine that we can get if we choose to and just leave it at that, I think everything will calm down and be fine. And as we've talked about before, the whole masking thing was so utterly blown out of proportion. And I believe anyway. And now I've noticed um, my brother, God bless him. I love him dearly, but he's a conspiracy theorist. That's and right. I guess, you said that. I, I guess he's getting, he's, and he is, he would, ne he's the most wonderful man. I mean, he would give you the shirt off his back. He's not one of these who's, you know, packing guns going around or anything. And, you know, he's not somebody who's going to go and kill anybody. He's not like that at all. He's actually a wonderful person who is, like I said, he would never, ever hurt. He, he adores animals. I mean, he would never hurt anybody, he, you know, and he doesn't go out with a gun on his nuts. I feel like, like there's a butt coming. I feel like <laughs> I, there's a big butt. <laughs> but, however, however. But, however. But, he's a, but he's a conspiracy theorist. And I guess he's getting all the junk that he forwards around, including to me. Oh, Lord. And um, my sister, too. But she doesn't read it. But I do just because I find it so fascinating. What's and, the next, of course, what's the scary because I know they're all passing it around to millions and millions of people who are believing it, which is, oh, my God, scary, scary, scary. But, so what's the latest conspiracy theory? What's the latest juicy one? What but, do they oh, bounce around. One? But now that they're no longer doing mass and – they, for a while, it was, it was, and this, of course, um, is recurring, but for a while with Ukraine, the beginning of the war, they were just, it was all about how the Ukraine is the guilty one. And it's, Putin is innocent in this whole thing. Really? Because, yes. Okay, that was Poor those conspiracy theories. And they brought up, you know, how Bill Gates was behind it, and... Um, and they're still bringing up Bill Clinton, by the way. And I'm like, can we just leave? Bill How Clinton. Did we... Bill Clinton was so. Can we just leave Bill Clinton alone? Fine. That's the <laughs> other thing. They're always like, trying. Like to... Leave Bill Clinton alone, please. Like, come on, haven't we bashed Bill Clinton enough? And isn't he gone? Isn't he done with? It? You know. I mean, like, what is so he doing? Like they're right? always yes. They're always dragging up all these people from the past. And so they can't get over anything. And I told my sister, it's like an addiction. Because once they're done with one thing, they move on to another thing. And it's totally, it never stops. But, the, but now they're back to, so they went from Ukraine, which comes up constantly. But next, then the next day, they'll pop to the, um, the virus, OK? And now it's about how everyone who got the shot is now dying. They're dying of brain tumors. We're not. And we have, no. we have the proof. The FDA is, has said themselves that every that you know 90% of those who got the original vaccine now are starting to show brain tumors. And stuff like this. So then then next time they'll bounce to how. Biden is poisoning all the cattle so that we'll have a beef shortage. 
and then the next thing will bounce to, I mean, it just goes on and on. And you better start hoarding wheat because the Ukraine and Russia are both. I have said that one. And now you better start hoarding wheat because it's must beer. <laughs> yeah, I know. What, what about beer? Oh my God. Um, what about, tell them the one you saw today. Remember when you saw About them? birds, about birds aren't real. They're like, like. Oh, I saw that, yeah. yeah. So you know the story about this one, right? So so this guy, so the guy, so right now this guy started, he started a fake oh, conspiracy God. theory as a satire that birds are government drones watching out of you. They're, they're not really birds. They're dr <laughs> drones watching out of you. Because he wanted to start something that was so crazy to make fun of the conspiracy theories. Guess what? People started believing it. People started <laughs> thinking, like, oh my God, the birds are drones. After millions of years. That's <laughs> why I got that one. No wonder. Have you heard this one? Say. Have you heard this one about the birds being drones? Yes. Oh, that's why I got that. My brother passed that along to me. So, so, so your God, brother does yeah. your brother believe it? Oh, I'm sure he does. Why would he have passed it along? So, oh yeah. So totally. I know. So yeah, we got, we got uh, uh, the drones eat the oh, birds. <laughs> they're passing all these along. And but, so what I was wondering, I mean, I get them I get them every day, you guys, and sometimes I get like six of them. He'll pile them up and send them all in one text. He texts them. And my sister's like, I don't read them. And I said, well, I read them because I want to know. I just, first off, some of them, I just can't believe them. So I'm just going, you know, and then some I think are so dangerous and I, they make me irate. And I think, and there are millions of people who are passing these along to millions of other people and they're dangerous you they're just they're sick and they're dangerous you know what used to be there so was, funny was this used to be the stuff that was you look, saw on the supermarket counter that your this, grandmother your great aunt would buy you'd see when you go visit her and she was the only person in the world who read like you know they would be like you know harry truman was really an alien you know and, and they would you know barbara streisand is, is she's from another dimension you know who from the past or you know they'd have all this crazy crap uh, and that, yeah. was, that was like fodder for the tabloids, you know, Area 51. Right. Now, that's the scary part of it. It's become mainstream. It's become, it, it's, it's somehow been because of the megaphone of social media right. and just the times we live in. And it's funny because I don't know anything about your brother, but if he's your brother, I'm assuming he's, you know, a pretty, maybe, I mean, he's, he's not in, I mean, smart, well, smart, smart. And he's, no, he's not stupid. No, he right. is not. I'm thinking he would be. I mean, you know, whatever. But that's that's what's changed. I don't know if you recall this, but back in the early days of the internet, the big conspiracy theory was a thing called Phantom Time. Now, have you ever heard of this? No. Okay, so here's how it works. It, it, this was in the 90s, in the early days, and this was back then, but then when this came out, the 90s was a different time. Bill Clinton was president, for one thing, and <laughs> it was just a different world. But <laughs> this, Phantom, this Phantom Time conspiracy theory, theory says that from 600 AD to 900 AD is totally made up. The Catholic Church made it up. Those years did not exist. They were really living in like 1700 somewhere that they just faked 300 years in history. And because there's no artifacts from that period, there's no history from that period, there's nothing. It just, they, they made it up because the emperor wanted to be the emperor at 1000 AD. But so he just said, well, let's just to tell everybody it's 1000 AD. And you know, all of a sudden, one day at 600 AD, you know, in 609, 690 AD, then the next week it's 1000 or it's 90 because this guy, and they just faked it. It's called Phantom Time. And it was a very popular conspiracy theory. But back then, everybody was like, good grief, who believes that crap? But now, <laughs> now that conspiracy theory almost seems like, well, you know, that could be possible, you know, compared to birds being drones, you know, or whatever. But uh, yeah. that's sort of the so it just goes to show you these things have been around for a while, and so there's nothing new about conspiracy. There's right. what's changed is the the appetite for them. There's this con consumption. Oh. Of, like you said, I think you hit yeah. it on the head. It's like an addiction. I think when you said that, it is an addiction because they're up all day long and all night long reading these as they're passed from person. They're reading them, and they can't stop. Once they read one, even if it's a different, they go from topic to topic to topic all day. When and, not, 
and, and, the, and, and the Facebook algorithms and the Twitter algorithms and YouTube algorithms understands if you watch a conspiracy YouTube video, then all of a sudden in your feed, they're going to start popping up over there. So the algorithm yeah. of these companies are feeding into that too. And so that's the other thing. I think that's contributing more than people realize because all of a sudden now, if you're a conspiracy yeah. theory person and you see, you know, you read the conspiracy theory that birds are drones and all of a sudden you watch the video for that, then over here, then you know, Bill Clinton, I don't know, that Ukraine started the war or Joe Biden's poisoning cattle or <laughs> Hillary Clinton's, you know, drinking yeah. kids' blood, you know, whatever they say. Yeah. And there are people who actually believe that for some reason, they believe that. And here's one that really, really bothered me because this was one where they were giving something as fact. They said that in Canada, they are now going to be euthanizing poor people on the street. Yeah. And my brother made the comment, I have to say, I'm sure this is going to start happening here soon. Well, they gave in the write-up, there's always a write-up like a news article, always. It's, and it's one of these guys, these crazy guys who starts these conspiracy theories, they always make it like an article. And they always quote some kind of source or give some kind of source that will give them legitimacy in the article. And this guy cited a new bill that Canada draft that Canada passed in their parliament. Well, I thought I'm going to read that because if they're going to start euthanizing people in the streets, then I want to know what this thing says that's giving them that permission. So I read it. Well, guess what? Do you want to know what that bill said? It was strengthening. First off, Canada has universal ability to commit suicide if you are, if you have a deadly disease. Right. They let you commit suicide. Yeah, they have right. they legalized euthanasia. Right. right. So they have euthanasia if you choose that route, medical, medically. And, of course, there are parameters set up that you must do before that, that you do that that are medical, that are you sign a lot of papers, all of that, and you have protections too. Well, this bill did not say anything, of course, about euthanizing people on the street or people forcing you to be euthanized. What it did was it gave protections to the mentally ill so that you could not go in and euthanize a mentally ill person oh. it tightened it but they they somehow so, morphed it into this euthanizing and they, yeah. into you they you can euthanize people living in the streets and it was the total opposite it was giving them more protections it said if a mentally ill person wants to be euthanized because it is they are they they are feeling so depressed or they're feeling so they want to be euthanized, then there are protections for them too. But they're even more so. Even more so. See, that's just, and that's, yeah, things get turned. But the funny thing is like these, like we said before, these conspiracy theories have been around forever. And they, there are a lot of things they are. There's a, somebody takes some truth and they twist it upside down, whether it's, you know, phantom time or birds being drones or, but we go back to the uh, the tabloids my uh, aunt, great aunt used to read or whatever, and they've always around the, the the question I have now is why have they all of a sudden become, they've almost become legitimized, they've almost become mainstream, and even people taking actions on them more so than ever. And that's, that's the thing I'm trying to sort of decode. I don't know if it's social media algorithms or what. Are you still there? Did we lose you? She's far as up. She's frozen. It's She's a conspiracy frozen. theory. She, she, she it's the birds. It's the drones. Time to stop. The drones did it. The drones are watching. Yeah, the drones watched her and they cut her cut her feed. I think so. We're probably next. You see any birds flying out there? Oh, yeah. Hey, you there? Hey, you're back. Did the wind knock yeah, you? No, it just, it just dropped out all of a sudden. You know what it was? It was the bird drones. <laughs> Pretty sure. <laughs> I think it was. Ty and I think it was the bird drones. Yeah. Or Bill Clinton. It, dang. Or aliens. Anyway, I think that there are a lot of people in this culture. It's still ringing. Do you hear it ringing? What ringing? It's still ringing. 
the phone. It's still ringing on Mine's my not end. Not. Mine's not. That Mine's is not. so weird. I'm sure that's it's because it's, uh, it's Bill Gates. I know Bill Gates is behind this. <laughs> Bill Gates. <laughs> Bill Gates, why? damn you. <laughs> why is it ringing on my end? It, am I supposed to, like, no, that'll turn the call off. So, yeah, you're on your phone now, right? Maybe Taryn's recalling you. I'm not on my phone. I'm on the Skype itself. This is weird. Joint conversation. I just did. We're just back on Skype on our little, can, getting closer. I don't want it on here. Shoot. Face that way. This Please. is where it's never done this before. I'm trying to look at Dai. Yeah, look at Dai. <laughs> I just didn't try. We, 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 we did a little different setup here too, so I hope we turned out okay, Taryn. Maybe Taryn, um, if I don't know if you're still there, you could maybe. I think we had we had we had most of. I mean, we we had a pretty good little conversation going About there. About 35 minutes. Yeah, so pretty much as long as we talk anyway. It, it just went by yeah. so fast because we were having fun. We were, we were. But can I ask you one question? Dale? Yeah. Oh, there go hearts. I did hearts that. Oh, 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 oh. No. I wonder, there, no, it's still on. It, that has got to be something from Karen. Okay. What's the question? Um, the question is, what do you know about Telegram? About? Now, now, now that the Musk has bought Twitter, we're going to, what are your predictions for that? Is it going to explode into the, the racist and craziness that it was before do you think and then what do you think about telegram is everybody going to go to that i'm not familiar with it uh, i'm probably just brought todd up so you could i knew todd would know what telegram was um, so i brought it up on the other screen here so i could look at it telegram i i don't do telegram no but i know it's real popular um you know it's a it's basically started off as a messenger app right you know and then people use it for posting and stuff like that so and there's been all this talk, right? Since a Musk, Elon Musk has taken Twitter, people are kind of kind of drop jumping ship. In fact, um, that, that's already what's happening, right? Uh, I don't know. Really? What, were you I on thought Twitter? they go back to that because now they can say whatever the f they want again. Right. Well, that that's what's kind of interestingly happened. Um, are, are you on Twitter first of all? No, I I quit doing Twitter, Twitter, and I quit doing Facebook because. They just, it's still so political and you still have to, there's still so many political messages, you know, would you vote for Trump over so-and-so? I mean, it's like, I get tired of that. I just get tired of even the ones that are not yelling about so, people. So by the way, just at this point, I'd like to interject a book that you'd probably read by a guy named Christopher Wiley. It's called Mine Effed, um, but that they use the whole word. And basically, he's the whistleblower on the Cambridge Analytica thing. Highly recommend okay. reading it. It will it will definitely feed into your conspiracy theory a lot. But he's got a lot of data. And basically, basically, yeah. he talks about how he worked inside and saw where a Facebook purposely tried to tweak their algorithms. Because basically, to, to get people who believe things together, as opposed to, you know, people who were different. So all of a sudden now, if you were a, you know, political conservative, you got grouped with other conservatives, it created an echo chamber. You, you know, you didn't think anybody else in the world believed differently than you because you're on Facebook and everybody on Facebook says this. Well, no, everybody does it. Facebook algorithm has figured out that's what you want to hear. But then they went on to talk about how they kind of got this data partially illegally because uh, it was international to right. help swing elections. You know, the, the Brexit was part of this, oh, yeah. uh, the 20, 2016 election. They talked about several other foreign elections. This guy actually testified before Congress. So um, I thought I would throw that out there. Uh, just you, it's, it, was a, it was a tough book to read at times. And, and you have to sort of realize that the guy who's writing is a little biased. There's sort of a, a, a author's bias from right. it. And you, know, you can't help but that creep. So if you put that filter up, there's, he's got a lot of what he has different than a lot of other people is a lot of interesting data and, and, and you know, evidence, you know, support it. Right. But with that yeah. said, you know, you're asking about Twitter. Um, it's, I, you know, I've had really mixed. I, I like Twitter. I use Twitter. And but I right. like to use it for like I get on the air when some of my geeky friends and we get around one of our geeky hashtags, hashtag Dragon Con. And, you know, so we can all geek out on there, you know, yeah. uh, that's oh. what I like it for. 
Definitely. No, and I know a lot of people who still use Facebook, who use Facebook for seeing pictures, and they like to put their pictures of their grandchildren, their children's weddings, and that sort of thing. But I just got to the point where I just couldn't stand the other stuff. Yeah. There's still, still so much political stuff that people run, and I just can't. Well, then you see your friends at the PC, your friends, and then all of a sudden you see their, uh, I, I understand everybody's got their political point of view. I'm not arguing that. But when you see somebody so monolithic and, you know, they right. talk about, they talk, and I'm not, I'm not trying not to get political here, but they talk about, I can't believe Biden's raised gas prices. But, you know, Biden didn't really raise gas prices. Oil companies did, you know. And, I mean, I understand, that's, that's, I'm not yeah. defending any policy that's going on. I'm just saying right. he did raise the prices, you know. But when you say that, it's it's totally, right. and so you, you, you see your friends yeah. post this stuff and then you're like, come on, man, you know. Yeah, they, the gas price, the gas company met because of the Ukraine Russia thing, and they said, they said, you know, it, the patriotic thing to do would be to keep prices where they are, but we're not going to do it. We're going to raise them, and they, and yeah. they, they did. Sure. It's fast. They met and they decided that. And they're so making it, they're making boatloads of money right now. They're making a ridiculous amount of money right now. They could easily say, you know what, we're going to take a hit for America. But also, you know why they don't? Because all these people are blaming Biden. Right. You know, and I'm not right. I'm not defending or standing up for him. We've right. reports. But right. the reason why get, if you know, these companies can do that is because these conspiracy theories people inadvertently give them air cover because they're blaming Biden or they're, maybe they're blaming the Republicans. You know, the other side blaming them. Either way. It's not the Republicans yeah. who raised gas prices. It's not Biden. It's the oil companies who did it. They, you know? So they, they're the ones, and they're they, making a boatload of money right now. So all much money. Are. Mm-hmm. So, all the companies are. The beef companies are. And all the beef yeah. companies are. And, and, and that sounds like that's kind of what wore you out. All that uh, political stuff on Facebook and all that. So yeah. I'm not on there as much. Todd's on there. Uh, you know, he's still on there. But he tries to say apolitical, don't you? No, not, I, you know, I check in, like, for here and, and Taryn, and I share, you know, things like that. And right. I still have a lot of clients on there. You know, I mean, for my company, I have to be on there. I mean, I've got... Yeah, you, a, do. Yeah, you do. When you have a company, it, it you've got a whole different view of social yeah, media. Yeah, so we have a Facebook. Our company has a Facebook page. Yeah. And a lot of my clients, yeah. a lot of them, they pay me to manage it for them, you know, so... And run yeah. ads and stuff like that. So um, I yeah. do that, you know, too. You have to be on LinkedIn. It's also become extremely political. See. I couldn't believe that. I don't do LinkedIn anymore either. I just okay. couldn't believe how people be. And everybody's always trying to sell you something now. And it used to be you're not supposed to do that. But now it's all about sales pitches on there. Right. But I used to do, oh, I've done, I've done 60, 70. LinkedIn profiles for people as a business writer. That used to be one of the services I offered, was writing people, helping people write their LinkedIn profiles and helping them write things that they could run as stories and pieces about their industry. So I was very involved with LinkedIn. But when I retired, I was like, that's it. I am am not going to read anything else on LinkedIn. It was like, I'm done with that. So... Do you do anything? Do you do any social media at all? No, not at all. None at all? You're totally social it. media neutral? No, I do not miss it. And I, I was burned out because that was my business. And I just was burned out on it. Yeah. I used to write people's tweets. I used to write people's LinkedIn's. I used to write people's Facebook messages. I used to do that for a living. I was just, oh, and then the political stuff started happening. I just totally burned out. Right. I just totally burned out. 40 years of doing business writing and then all that social media stuff became mandatory for me to, you know, do as a business writer. I had to, you know, and I enjoy doing it for people. I won't say I didn't enjoy it when I did it for a living, but when I stopped, I was just totally burned out on writing. So there you go. Well, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and drop a, an idea for us to talk about next time because I know we're in a time because I've been wanting to ask you about this for a long time because you're a writer, you're a real writer, you've been writing for a long time. When I say you're a real writer, you were writing before, was, you've been writing I, long I, before, just, yeah, it was you, even I before. Made a living. I actually made a living. You were a professional a writer. writer. So I would yes. like, and you could think about it, but I'd like to get your idea because all of a sudden now there's this new crop of artificial AI programs that write you know uh-huh. Uh, uh-huh. 
And so, um, you know, they actually, you can, they, they put, they write copy for you. They, uh, and, and they're very young, you know, they're, now they're, you know, and you can actually, they, but now they've got to where they're affordable for business people. And I have people, you know, and just so, you know, you know, my company's technological, you know, we're tech technical people. We, we sell the technology side of all this, but I have a lot of people who are talking to me about, can we use an AI to write all my content? You know, I need to write content for my website. It's hard to do. Can we use one? Of, I found this AI program. Can we use it? So I'd love to get your thoughts. I know if you haven't heard of it, I thought I'd mention to you. So maybe you could look into it and think about what they call it. They're calling it AI, artificial intelligence generated content, you know, that people wow. are using on the website. So be curious what you wow. think about it. So I I, wow. I, I I will tell you that I have been experimenting with it. I actually have got a program I've been playing with. I've got several yeah. actually that I'm actually you know, using more as a science project to see what it's like than anything. But as a real writer, yeah. I would love to get your take on it. Go go look into it and maybe we can talk about it next time if you're up for it. Yeah, no, I'd love to talk about it. Yeah, I'd love to talk about it. Absolutely. Why not? I mean, it's a subject I know well. So. Right, because that's what I've also sure. thought like. like I'm sure I have plenty to say because I never have plenty to say anyway. Ever. But, um, <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I'm always so shy about everything. Right, but, so shy. But I, I didn't know if you had a chance to even look at it, so I mentioned it, so maybe you could go look into it. I'm, I'm game because it would be so interesting for me, and I hate to think that another group of people would be put out of business, you know? Especially since... You know, I'm a humor. I'm a humorist now. So, um, and, you, and I love writing. I love being a humorist. I'm right. having so. It's great. It's great. I mean, yeah, I think fine. I was always meant to do humor, and yeah. I'm loving that's after good, years yeah. of business. It. I'm just having such a good time with humorous writing. I really am. I don't so, think I don't but, think AIs get humor, so I think you're safe. I'm pretty sure artificial. Yeah. Has got you. That may be the one thing. If they ever take over the world, if Skynet ever takes over, the one thing we'll have over them is our sense of humor. We, you know, so I think. I <laughs> but the other thing I want you guys to do is look into Telegram and its founder. I will. Okay. I, in Wired magazine, I just read a huge article about the founder of Telegram and how Telegram works and how it's working today with its concepts. And the founder's really interesting too. So, but that is really, you know, a lot of the crazies have gone crazy. A lot of the folks with conspiracy theories and, you know, things to say have gone to Telegram because it has no rules. Yeah. And, and that's, what, that's what they said. This just things happened to Twitter. Will Twitter become Telegram now? Well, Elon Musk in there, because unfortunately, you know, um, yeah, I see what you're saying. It's a pretty big topic. You know, if he comes in there and pulls off all the, the restraints, well, yes. is that necessarily a good thing, you know, or is it freedom of speech is, it sounds good yes. conceptually, but in, in, in you know, this, it gets back to the thing, like, we've always had, uh, uh, you know, restrictions on freedom of speech. Like, you can't, yeah, you know, the old, the old cliche, you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. Well, that freedom of speech, I should be able to do that. Well, no, you know. Right. And Twitter, and, Twitter has brought that version of that to Twitter, and now people are screaming, "Oh, foul, foul!" You know, but like, well, wait a minute, you know, we've we've already covered this. You know, the, the, there are certain areas of freedom of speech we need to keep under control. You know, and, and with Elon Musk, and that's what I've heard, I know what you're talking about, Telegram, and of course it's one of these other ones that's, you know, then the, you go to the other side. There's Truth Social, which is Donald Trump's platform, but then they're saying that Twitter, you know, Elon Musk wants to come in and turn it, take all the restrictions off, and be like, that's not. You know, you know, both both all different people from all different things or walks of life and political spectrums are saying, I'm not sure that's a good thing, you know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I might be kind of like that too, you know, because I like Twitter, but I want to feel like, you know, it's a little bit safe on there, you know. I don't want to be with a bunch of people just saying anything, right? Right, right, exactly. So. Yeah, exactly. So those were just some of the ideas, but it also, I think you'd find, you'd find it fascinating reading about the history of Telegram and the founder, who, you know, is a very young Russian man. Yes, yes, I do know what you're talking about. Yeah, I've read about this guy. I read some small article about it, and I've heard people compare it, but I have not. I know the Wired article you've talked about, but I haven't read it. I haven't read it, but I've, I've seen it yet. It's, I wasn't going to read it because it's a very long article, but it's very good, and it's a real eye-opener. Very good. So All right. you might definitely want to read. I'm a big Wired magazine fan. 
a big Wired magazine. Oh, me I've too. been reading Wired magazine for 20 years. Oh, wow. Yes. I, I didn't know I could like you more, but now I do. I'm a, yeah. that's, oh, that's, I'm a, a that's a geek, you know, uh, staple, man. I learned so much from it. I try to keep up with things. I may not know everything, but I try to keep up with things. So, and I just, the, the writing in that magazine is awesome. And that's what I was attracted to in the beginning because I could actually, I thought the writing was so good. You know, it's all AI, right? I'm just kidding. Yes. I'm just, I'm just, yeah. not, that's so, not, it's but, real people but, writing for yeah, work. They have great investigative journalism. They do. They do. So, it's so, real. Anyway, I, I saw Taryn's note about is it time to say goodbye? So, guys, it was been great talking to you. It was a pleasure. As always, so um, let's set up another date and of yes, course. talk well, about writing and talk about Telegram. We've got some great topics. Yeah, and we do. see if we can get Nathan in here. No, maybe have you, have you met Nathan? No, I haven't. Uh, so he's fun. He's, he's fun, too. but he's he's pretty he's good. pretty intense. He's what? He's intense. So he'll be oh. fun. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's great. No and he, yeah, yo, no, that's what I'm saying. It'll be fun, and he's got he's got opinions. So, so okay. he'll, yeah. You have opinions too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. All right. Great. Hey, Taryn, we're signing Bye. off now. Bye, we're signing off. Goodbye. Bye.